Well, hello there to all of our automotive and high-performance enthusiasts who are uh, burning up the tires all around the planet Earth. You've done it once again. You have uh, hit the play button on yet another... Kevin, another Duende episode of V8 Radio. <laughs> du- duende? Yeah, man. Uh, that means a quality of passion and inspiration. Oh, well, that goes without saying. All right. Well, this uh, is the V8 Radio podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Oste, joined as always by our esteemed co-host, Mr. Mike Cuball clark And this time, we have a very special guest with us, Mr. Michael Joseph. Michael, welcome. Thank you very much. All right. Well, before we get into Michael's story and uh, why he's visiting today, as per tradition, mm-hmm. here at the V8 Radio podcast, we start every episode with an automotive esque trivia question uh, to which we throw out to each other in the beginning and then hold the answer revealing them hopefully triumphantly at the end of the show (laughs) (laughs) and hopefully hopefully it's a question that uh has the correct answer to it's be a very duenduous situation Mm. and strenuous yes so because we're gracious hosts mr joseph have you uh in fact prepared a trivia question for this episode Yes, I have. Oh boy, are you ready? Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, ask ask it of Mike first. <laughs> <laughs> Release the hounds. Okay. All right. So you're familiar with Muscle Car Review magazine? Yes, sir. All right. Back in 1984, they published uh, a listing of the top quarter mile uh, muscle cars. And the top three, what top three quarter mile ranking infuriated every Mopar enthusiast on the planet? Ooh. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Oh, I think that it was that, that, okay, so this upset every Mopar guy. Mm -hmm. I think it was the, um, the Shelby GLH. Oh, is, is what I think. Oh, what a great guess. How about that? It's the so, four-cylinder turbo, and at that time, so many people were you know, still into V8s, fire-breathing muscle car V8s, and how dare a four-cylinder dethrone them? Wow. Yeah, that's a very interesting. All right, so the GLHS turbo would yes. be your guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's right. Close, but well, it's, um, it more it, relates to what we're going to be talking about tonight. Yeah, it's so okay. Buick-based car. I, I will wager my guess, Michael, and I'm going to say it was a seventy GS Stage One. Seventy GS Stage One. Oh, that makes uh, even more sense. Mm. Yes, you got it. So the the answers are the ranking. <laughs> For the top three quarter mile uh, muscle cars, number one was the 427 Shelby Cobra, 1967. Number two was the 427 Corvette, also a 67. And then the third fastest car of the era was the 1970 Buick Grand Sport with the 455 Stage 1. Mm. Hmm. Yep. Known as the Hemi Killer, by the way. Nice. And that article is is right. widely widely de- uh, disputed today, and and uh, those races are reenacted at the uh, a lot of the national Buick meets where they square the Hemis off against the Buicks, and the Hemi guys try to reclaim their uh, their crown. So yeah, that was try a- to re- re- regain their manhood. <laughs> yeah, well, there's plenty of man. Yeah, so it, it trades back and forth, you know. Sometimes the Hemi guys win, sometimes the Buick guys win. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, um, that was a good one. I, uh, Mike Cuball Clark, have you prepared a trivia question? Indeed, I have, Kevin. All right. This one's going to be a nice, easy, short, sweet, and to the point. Uh, what did Felix Vankel of Germany develop in 1954? Uh huh. And because we are good hosts, we are going to let our guest have first crack at this one. There you go. 
The Vankel Rotary Engine. Ooh, uh, great with, guess. With authority. <laughs> with authority. <laughs> I like your pronunciation. Thank you. Thank you very much. The w pronounced as a V. That mm-hmm. was uh, that was a big end. Well, Q balls an amateur German. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On my mother's side. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm. Well, you know, as fate would have it, he he, he took my guess because that's what mm. I was going to say too. Well, by golly, I'll just uh, we'll wait to find out. On we'll that. find out at the end of the show, fellas. What I think is interesting is that the date nineteen fifty four. Yeah. Uh, if if the correct answer is the rotary engine, I thought it was a lot older than that, but that's mm. just me. We'll find out. Yeah, indeed, we will. All right, carry on, uh, sir. Okay, so I've got one, too. Uh, we'll blow, blow right through this yep. one. Okay. What was the first flying car and the bonus for what year? Woo. Hmm. What was... Well, I'll let, we'll let Michael go first. <laughs> yeah, it's because we're gracious <laughs> hosts. <laughs> we are gracious hosts. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Hmm. You know... Uh, I don't know the name of the car, but I would venture a guess that it was sometime, if not the 60s, the 70s, they put wings on a little car and had it fly. All right. So uh, 1960s or we'll just say early 70s is Mr. Joseph's guess. Cue ball, what do you got? So what was the first flying car? Good heavens, man. And bonus for the year. Bonus for the year. Uh, well, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna tank the the, the question here. <laughs> it's the confidence that really gets me. Yeah, right. Um, <laughs> uh, the first flying car. Um, it was the. Uh, the Chanute flying car. I don't know. And it was, the year was, I'll say 1959. Uh-huh. 1959. Produced by the widely known Chanute Aero what? Car Company, apparently. He right? was a, 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 an aviation pioneer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. We'll find out. That's a good guess. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in nineteen fifty, Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Sh- Dude, it better not be the answer. <laughs> uh, well, we'll find out at the end yeah. of the show. So, at this point, we're going to introduce our guest, uh, Michael Joseph, who's uh, a very interesting guy who uh, has uh, a lot, a lot going on in his world, but ties together a couple things that we think are pretty interesting. Uh, one of them, of course, being high performance cars and muscle cars, and is the owner and uh, you know, kind of. There's been so many people that have worked on that car, kind of the project manager of a super bad '69 Electra. But also coupled with something that Mike and I are both huge fans of, and that is aviation, more specifically military aviation, more specifically the uh, Tuskegee Airmen, right? That is right. The uh, Tuskegee Airmen's Faithful Pursuit is the first officially recognized Tuskegee Airmen tribute car. Um, The Tuskegee Airmen formed their own organization called Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated in 1972. And there are about 50 chapters in the United States. And one of the chapters, the Captain Claude B. Govan chapter in New York, is the chapter that I'm affiliated with. I'm a, uh, an officer and a member. I was sworn in in 1987 by New York State Judge George Fleury, who himself was class of 45A out of Tuskegee, and George Fleury was my cousin on my mother's side. Wow. That's amazing. And, um, yeah, we were very fortunate to have, uh, at the unveiling, seven of the original Tuskegee Airmen present as um, uh, Major General Mike Hall, USAF retired, 
the executive director at our venue at the Wings of Eagles Discovery Center in Big Flats, New York. He did the, the dedication, and uh, my wife and I uh, drove the car out of the hangar at uh, the um, uh, Elmira Regional Airport base of uh, that Discovery Center. 200 guests, you know, we raised money for uh, kids interested in pursuing their careers in uh, aerospace and technology that night. I think we raised about $3,500 nice. for them. It was a great event. Wow. So there, there's a lot to unpack there, which is uh, uh, very cool. So the Tuskegee Airmen were uh, essentially um, World War II uh, dogfighter and bomber pilots that flew for the United States and others, correct? They helped other countries? Um, no, the, the Tuskegee Airmen, they, they were United States Army Air Corps. So they flew... Um, escorting American bombers to strategic targets in Europe. You know, we were fighting the Nazis. Uh, the, um, the Tuskegee Airmen initially uh, were not wanted. They did not feel that blacks, you know, uh, in, back in the segregated days, they didn't mm -hmm. feel that blacks were capable of <laughs> handling fighter aircraft, sophisticated aircraft, and... Uh, and so battlefield commanders also felt that uh, morale would be affected if black troops were to serve alongside white. So it was a very complicated issue back in those days. But the United States needed help. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was called upon to do what it is they could for our country. And uh, when the Tuskegee Airmen got into the got into battle, they made damn sure that they were going to make a difference, and they did. Yeah. They had a, a superb combat record, uh, flying fighter escort uh, over uh, strategic targets in Europe. What I think, uh, you know, it, it's amazing to think how different times were back then and how crazy that thought sounds today, first of all. Um, but also, yeah, those guys sure proved them wrong and demonstrated some amazing abilities. And I'm almost wondering if, you know, at the time, the uh, the white guys just maybe were a little bit afraid of being shown up <laughs> by their black counterparts in the Tuskegee Airmen, you know, because there were some insanely capable pilots, like you're saying. And the reason why I asked in the beginning if they flew for anybody else, you may know more than I do, but I think there's a story of at least one of the Tuskegee Airmen who um, trained some French fighter pilots in World War II um, and, and military pilots. And I don't know if it's true, but I remember reading that somewhere that uh, whoever this gentleman was, was kind of dispatched to uh, to help the French Air Corps or whatever they're they're called. So I I could tell you that um, um, I'm not familiar with that story. However, in World War One, uh, there again, uh, black people weren't allowed. Americans weren't able to uh, fight for um, in the American Air Force at all, and so uh, you had a, a black fighter pilot. Eugene Jacques Boulard, he was fluent in French, he was an American, but, but went to France because he wanted to fight. And this guy became, his nickname was the Black Swallow of Death. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, great nickname. So, Man. So he became a, a well-known fighter pilot fighting with the French in World okay. War One. So maybe that's where I crossed and up then, my stories. It's, you know, so many things are possible. Blacks fought for England. You had um, a squadron commander uh, with the RAF, uh, huh. Sir Ulrich Cross, 
you know, uh, with the uh, there was a Caribbean squadron called the called the um, Jamaica squadron, and it was integrated. You had blacks and you had whites that were flying, and uh, some of these guys fought in the Battle of Britain. Wow, that's uh, amazing. The, the um, uh, Russians had some African pilots as well. Now that seems surprising to me. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I mean it was to me. And our historian, a former a New York chapter his, historian, Dick Braithwaite, sent me the paperwork, sent me the article about it. Wow. And I had never heard of that before. <laughs> but but talent, um, when people need that talent, that's what breaks the barriers. That's what breaks discrimination. When you do something and you're really good at it, and there's a need, that's when those distinctions of, of color and religion and gender melt away. Absolutely. So we got to have this guy because this guy is fantastic. Yeah, um, without a doubt. And so one of the questions that I have then is, how did these um, airmen get the training if in the U.S., there was really no plan to enlist their services as pilots. You know, if they, they didn't think they were going to actually, you know, employ these guys to go fight mm -hmm. or was it just out of necessity at that point? Well, Kevin, that's a great question. This thing has been uh, something that uh, our people have been fighting for, for many years. They wanted to participate in the armed forces. Uh, they had done so in the infantry uh, in the previous war, blacks fought in every campaign, every war that this country has been in since before America was even a country. <laughs> so, you know, uh, by the time World War II comes along, this new service that had been around actually since World War I, uh, people were petitioning. They were writing their congressmen, you know, I, my son wants to be involved in this. And they were getting turned down. But they had um, uh, young people who had been getting their licenses, private pilots' licenses, in the 1930s. And so some of these people became the instructors. And when the, the government finally said, yes, let's start working on a field, let's break ground at Tuskegee. And they did so, I think it was 1941, before the war started. Because they're anticipating there's something happening in Europe. We had, we had better start preparing for this. Mm -hmm. And so it was just a matter of time before uh, there was enough momentum and enough push from the, uh, you know, there was a union, black sleeping car uh, porters union that pushed for this. There was the black press. And there was a sizable black population that were, that were, pushing for equality here. And so uh, they finally got a big boost when Eleanor Roosevelt came to the field and wondered why these men aren't in combat. <laughs> she sees them flying and she said, I want to go up in one of these planes with one of these men. And so the Secret Service called the White House, as the story goes, and told President Roosevelt, told FDR, and he says, well, if the First Lady wants to go up, you better let her. You know, she was <laughs> not right on, and for sure. So, so she went up with uh, the chief uh, chief instructor, whose name was Chief, nicknamed Chief, Chief Anderson, and um, that photograph is what swayed public opinion and made people around the world recognize that blacks have the capability to fly, to, to, to fly and fight. And um, that was the start of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I mean, again, it's unfortunate that it took all the way up to the first lady, uh, you know, getting in, in, in the plane to say, look, these guys have talent and ability, but I'm so glad that that happened, you know, and uh, uh, kind of opened their eyes and allowed them to be uh, part of the, the effort. And, you know, again, looking through the lens of today and, and, and in history, 
what I also find fascinating and, and what I truly admire is the level of patriotism that a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, blacks in our military had, even though uh, our country at the time was not doing right by them, by not allowing them to participate in society with segregation and all the rest of the stuff that went along with it. And yet these people still said, no, 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 I want to fight for this country. Yeah. And besides, the alternative really sucked. We didn't <laughs> want to be around if Adolf Hitler became president. So uh, this is true. Said, I'll be yeah. damned if I'll let some Nazis take over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. That's uh, yeah, uh, yeah. That was that was the attitude in part. You know, they were very part. They were patriotic. Because they believed in the ideals uh, of the Constitution, of what all men are created equal and have certain inalienable rights. They believed that if they did a good job, that things would improve for not just black people, but there were a lot of other marginalized Americans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And remember, we're coming out of the era where no Irish need apply. Right. Uh, oh, Asians yeah. Asians were discriminated against. You had a lot of that going on back then. It's hard to think of it uh, in that same context now. But back then, you know, 75, 80 years ago, there was a lot of bias and uh, a lot of conflict among different, um, you know, people from different countries. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, even though even though they were all white, you still had conflict between the American Germans and you had the, the Polish and the Greeks and a lot of other people. And mm -hmm. Neighborhoods were segregated. And the, the language uh -huh. was a barrier. And World War II, if nothing else, it brought Americans together. Yeah. Yeah, and that obviously was magnified if you also looked differently than somebody else. You know, if, if yeah. white people, you know, were not accepting of another white person just because of language or ethnic background, if you were, you know, an Asian or, or you know, dark-skinned in some way, then you, you really got it. Uh, in some ways, I think, you know, it's great how far we've come, but, of course, we're still not there yet. Yeah. But I, I believe in those ideals, too, of the yeah. Constitution. and. The the other you mentioned um, talent and ability being a neutralizer of of the prejudice. I always say that one of the other great uh, things that brings people together are cool cars. All the way around the yeah. world, if you have a cool car, it doesn't matter who you're with; they think it's cool too. Which brings me to your Buick and the tie-in between the Buick and the Tuskegee Airmen. Yes. Now, the Faithful Pursuit is quite an interesting automobile. Now, Faithful Pursuit, it is um, uh, a 1969 Buick Electra 225 Custom Sport Coupe. That's basically what it is. And back in those days, this was the large American sedan. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very popular, particularly... In the black community, because this car, it was a bit less expensive than a Cadillac. And uh, so it was, it offered good quality. Uh, it was uh, a very nice driving car. It was efficient. Back in the days when typical luxury cars were getting 14 miles to the gallon, or 12 miles to the gallon, a Buick Electra like mine, could get 17 to 20 miles to the gallon. Wow. Depending, depending on the gear ratio that you got. You got the economy rear at 256. In the rear, you get 20 miles to the gallon on the good gas that they had back then, the leaded premium. Mm -hmm. So this car has been taken completely apart. And every aspect of its performance has been enhanced. It has a seven-point roll cage. It has uh, a, a, 
the initial motor was a 455 stage one that was built by Scotty Gadagno. It was a 500 horsepower, uh, 535 pound foot motor. And we were running uh, I-12s with it, 12.9 wow. at 103 miles per hour. And the car weighed about 47, 4,800 pounds. Jeez, <laughs> my <laughs> goodness. That's really That's moving. Big, That's a big sled, yeah. yeah, yeah. For, for that kind of car. But this car, uh, it uh, had a special chassis. Going back to the days when stock cars were pretty much stock automobiles that were modified. And the old Winston Cup spec uh, was that you would take, uh, put a five bar uh, suspension in the rear and you would have, um, uh, you know, your coils were, were shortened coils with jacking bolts and your, your uh, shocks were put outside of the, the shock tower at an angle to give you better shock action. And so this chassis was modified by both Gary Shaw, who is a champion racer, you know, uh, Hall of Famer, mm -hmm. and um, Dave Machuga, who is a five-time modified racing champion in this area. Uh, I'm in upstate New York. I'm in uh, the southern tier of New York. And so both these gentlemen worked on this car. At a time when uh, I had requested other groups to help me with this car, and people just, you know, their eyes glazed, glazed over, what do you want to do that for? <laughs> Nobody does this with that kind of car. Yeah. No, I'd say that kind of car needed to be done. Well, maybe that yeah. was the reason why you wanted to do it, too. You know, you wanted to do something that nobody else had done. Yeah, for sure. And, uh one of the reasons why it was a good candidate was the Tuskegee Airmen flew something called the P-47 Thunderbolt. It was, before they got the Mustang that they're most famous for, the first red tail fighter was a Jug. It was the, the largest, heaviest, most powerful single-engine piston fighter plane flown by any side in World War II. It was a very survivable aircraft. You can, uh, it could sustain a lot of damage, either ground to air or air to air combat damage and still keep flying. And so in contrast, this Buick Electra, it mimics the turbo supercharger arrangement of the B-47 Thunderbolt, which had its turbo behind the pilot, intercoolers behind the pilot, in the latest revision of the Buick, the Buick has a uh, twin turbo setup, which is just above the rear axle, and the intercoolers are where the rear seats used to be. <laughs> and so we we feed air in through the quarter windows, and it's vented through the uh, through vents uh, in the wheel tubs. That's got to make so an interesting Buick, sound right behind you when, when you're at the uh, Oh, my full goodness. Scream. It sounds like a jet in there. You <laughs> yeah. can't even hear the engine. And there's no exhaust. Oh, wow. <laughs> no, no That's muffles, killer. No mufflers. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's quite a thing. Because it weighs so much. Sure. Uh, it doesn't have the, the uh, acceleration curve that most lightweight cars have, you know, it, doesn't launch, uh, in, uh, to put it in drag, drag terms, um, you know, you get a good launch and your 60 foot is maybe, um, um, what is it, 1.6 seconds. Right. 1.7 okay. seconds, something like that. And when we had the 455 stage one, we were launching and getting uh, 1.88, I think. Mm -hmm. out of that but this thing it has uh, 2.2 seconds in order for it to spool up and finally get sure. moving once it uh once about two and a half seconds passes 
and it gets to full boost, it is quite a ride. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's got all all that weight, so it's sticking. You're not breaking the tires. Right. It's just moving. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, First of all, Big Buick engines, and I, I know I'm a Buick guy, these are not necessarily known for living long under boosted situations. So what did you guys do to the block and the, the lower end to keep this thing together? Okay, first of all, there were a lot of theories out there as to why Buick engines fail. People were thinking that, the um, well, it doesn't have four-bolt mains, so there's no way it's going to be stable enough or strong enough to handle the boost. So Scotty Godagno, if you know Scotty, you know, he was Pat Musi's top dyno man. Scotty held the record with his Buick, his quarter mile uh, record stood for over 30 years. You can imagine that. And was that, uh, was that in the white Regal? Was that his? No, no. Well, he had that uh, white Regal, as okay. well. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it yeah. was a little like a 92 or 93 Regal. And yeah. He was doing, you know, 20 years ago, he was doing seven sevens at 180 miles an hour. Right. And then the car, the car's much faster now. The car's still around. Um, but he had a big Buick, a 1970 with a 455, 4,700 pound car running nitrous, 700 horsepower on nitrous. And he was doing 11 sevens at 118 miles an hour with that car. Hmm. And Scotty said this. He said, what happens is the reason why people are wiping bearings and doing a lot of other bad things to their motors once you, you do anything like boost or nitrous, and I may not be quoting him exactly, but he said that, when the piston gets hot and there is more friction uh, associated with uh, the piston and bore relationship, you're going to have the rod uh, under considerably more stress, and it's going to bend a little bit. And then that's where you start to have your problems. So it's not necessarily the bottom end like we all thought. You know, for years. So I thought, okay, I'm going to work with JE and we're going to make a special set of pistons that have uh, thermal coatings and wear coatings. Thermal coatings on the top and we're going to put wear coatings on the skirts of the piston. We're going to do thermal coatings in a combustion chamber, ink and L exhaust valves. And so this motor has been running under boost for 10 years before getting a rebuild. <laughs> Well, I, I think so you we, I think you figured it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think so. We brought it to Mickey Marolo because we had some issues with our ignition system and the fuel injection, and a lot of smoke was coming out of the motor. Last time we took it to the track, and we said, "Okay, I'm just going to take it apart. It's been together for so long. Let's take a look at." It. Now, we use Brad Penn oil, mm-hmm. which I. I swear by it. It's the old Brad pen that looks like, when it's new, it looks like it needs to be changed because it's practically black. It's it's (laughs) dark, dark green. It's got so many mollies and other things in there. Well, uh, Mickey Marolo, who's near me, Scotty's way down in Florida, Mickey Marolo Racing Engines, took the thing apart, and they said, there's virtually no wear on your pistons and rings. And so... (laughs) Hmm. We're putting all of that stuff back in there. It's your main bearings have some issues. Mm-hmm. So what we suspect is that the ignition system, the Holly Super Sniper, was not communicating with the MSD uh, ignition, and we had some detonation. But it didn't hurt mm-hmm. the pistons. You could see a little nick in the, uh, the thermal coating, but mm-hmm. not, you know everything else was good. So eventually, it was just kind of pounding the bearings. Yes. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, we put it together. The motor is still uh, outside the car, and we'll, we'll put that uh, back in another few weeks and get it tuned and get ready to break the record. Another one of the Buick uh, weaknesses, if you will, is the oiling system. Uh, you know, for a, yes. a production car, the design is brilliant because they have – the all-encompassing timing cover on the front of the engine that's aluminum and it mm-hmm. holds the fuel pump, it holds the oil pump, uh, and it holds the distributor and all that stuff. So, But the problem is, A, over time, the, the gears start to hog out the aluminum inside the pump and it uh, uh, reduces pressure and whatnot. But they also yeah. are not really known for pushing a whole lot of volume. So what did you guys do for the oiling system on that? So first, um, I went to TA Performance. They redesigned that front cover, Mm -hmm. and they have a set of high-volume gears, and uh, TA will take an oil pump, and they will port match it to the new cover, flow test it, and pressure check it, and that's how I get them. Uh, None of my racing engines have the old original uh, setup. It's all from T8. Yeah, that's a nice cover. Those guys do really, they do nice work down there. Yeah, they're, they're excellent. You know, I, I, I stand by them. Uh, Mike Tomasuski, he's been doing this for decades. He knows what he's doing. And um, I tell people, uh, you can try to do it yourself or go to the local Chevy guy uh, and you can spend your money two times over if you want, or you can just get it done right. Go yeah. to somebody who knows, get parts from people who who really live this stuff and are dedicated to give you the right information and the right part for your job. Yep. So the turbo motor, you, you, when you were first talking, you were telling us about the, uh, the 455 Stage 1. What kind of numbers have you been running with the turbo engine in this car? So this motor... Uh, firstly, it's a 430, so it does not have as large a bore, and it makes the block a little stiffer. It has a, uh, a halo in it. It's a steel part that ties all of the, um, the main caps together. Mm-hmm. And although we do not know, uh, it, it has not been on a floor dyno to tell us what the actual output is but the, by calculation we determined that we're pushing about 750 horsepower mm-hmm. uh, the everything on the in the motor and all the way back to the studs has been sized for a thousand horsepower so what we what we have is a situation where we over designed we want to push the motor up to 800 horsepower. We know it'll survive at 800. And we know that everything back, the flex plate, the transmission, the drive shaft, you know, we got a Ford 9 inch back there built by uh, GT for GT Performance Ford. You know, he did the Mosier axles for us and the, the high impact gears. And, you know, You've got the right kind of studs in it. Everything is done to handle a thousand horse. Mm-hmm. And this is um, a Turbo 400 still for transmission? Or? Yeah, originally uh, the electors with the long tail, they called them Turbo 375s. Uh, and hmm. It did not have as many clutches as the Turbo 400. But we took it apart and we built the insides like a turbo 400 plus it has choline clutches and steels it it has a uh, a lower first gear and um we're using an an edge racing torque converter and a jw performance wheel jw performance flex plate Mm -hmm. and initially When we were running, hmm? uh, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, we were. Uh, uh, we had set it up for the Silver State Classic, 
which we went out to back in 2009. And so we had a, uh, a gear vendors overdrive at the end of it. And the GAV overdrive gave us an additional gear. So four, four speed and we had a 248 set up in a uh, 2.48 gear ratio. So our theoretical top speed was 212 miles an hour. <laughs> and, never and, and did it, did that stay theoretical? <laughs> it stayed theoretical. <laughs> you know, uh, the Silver State Classic, those folks, they're great folks, and they say they believe in safety first. And so they would not let us uh, travel to a, a high speed. You know, they didn't want you going over 100 miles an hour the first time you're out there. And so Fair enough. I could say we did not run with the Silver State Classic. We did some things on our own. Which I will not discuss publicly. <laughs> well, the statute of limitations is probably expired by now. <laughs> well, it's Nevada too, right? They yeah. don't care. <laughs> what laws? <laughs> uh, but I tell you that the roads out there are absolutely phenomenal. Whether you're driving a seventy miles an hour or one hundred and twenty-five miles an hour, it feels mm-hmm. like you're like you're going slow because it's just so straight. And, you know, there's nothing out there for 200 miles. You see mountains and they're 200 miles away. The air is so clear mm-hmm. that they look like they're right there and you're driving hours to get to them. For sure. Yeah, the state of Nevada has that weird illusion. And you also see that on the Las Vegas Strip because it's like, oh, yeah, that building, that casino is like right there. And then it takes you all night to walk to it if you're dumb <laughs> enough to try. Uh, <laughs> They so they tell me. Yeah, so they so I hear. Yeah. <laughs> uh, exactly, sort of like my situation. So, how did you end up being a, a big fan of the uh, of the electric yourself? Uh, only because um, uh, when I was very young, uh, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, my neighbor had a 1959, uh, mm. and um, it was the first year. For the Electra 225. Mm-hmm. It was a dark blue sedan, white top, four door. Mm. And um, I saw the car many years later uh, when I was in my, I guess I was about 30. And I first saw it when I was six years old. Wow. And wow. I, I saw it drive. I hadn't seen it in decades. And uh, visiting New York after. Uh, you know, taking a job with Johnson and Johnson as an engineer in Georgia, I came back to visit, and I saw the thing drive by, and I thought, "Holy mackerel, is that the same car that hmm. I knew when I left this neighborhood back in '66?" And sure enough, it was the same car. I went there and I, I asked around, "Who owns this car?" And they showed me the house, and I talked to them. I said, "Well, when, when did you guys move in here?" He said, yeah, we moved in here in 1958, and we bought this car wow. uh, in 1958, and we've had it ever since. And I, oh, oh, man. It so happened that I, was, I had in mind to build a special car since I was about 12 years old, 12, 13 years old. And so I spent some time in the library. I went to Brooklyn Tech High School, and I would spend time looking at the the Chilton's books and, and other automotive books, trying to figure out which motors had the highest torque and horsepower. Mm-hmm. And it turned out that, because um, I, I was thinking that torque is what really drives acceleration. Mm-hmm. And uh, I wanted to find out who had the most powerful car, the most powerful motor. And, there's a lot of hype out there. There's a lot of Madison Avenue uh, folks that are trying to sell you on this or that. And so I was just looking at the numbers. I was in an, an engineering-based um, school, and, and we were studying this sort of thing, horsepower and efficiency and uh, all of that. And so I, I looked at it very analytically, and the Buick engine kept coming up hmm. as the engine um, to get. And so I started looking around and I started listening to those motors 
and and hearing the stories. That's when some of these, uh, I guess, legends, for one of a one of a better term, started to, to come out. Um, guys were um, uh, racing these cars back in the days when the police were cracking down on that sort of thing. And so mm -hmm. racing kind of went underground. Sleeper cars became popular. Mm -hmm. And so there was one particular kind of sleeper car that seemed to um, just emerge as the fastest, most effective sleeper. And that was the Buick Electra. Hmm. And there were... Just all kinds of kill stories. Buick Electra's <laughs> outrunning dual quad uh, 427 vets, <laughs> 440 Chryslers, you know. And I've seen some of this with my own two eyes. <laughs> These guys mastered uh, how to run nitrous. Back in the early days, we're talking about 1979, 1980. And there was a guy uh, named uh, Uncle Buddy, they called him. And <laughs> Uncle he was Buddy. A, All right. a street racer who uh, wore bib overalls. <laughs> and he had the fastest Buicks in the city. And he was, he was killing them out there. And some of these illegal tracks where people raced, you know, in midnight mm -hmm. races for money. And... Uh, I've never seen him. I've seen some of the cars, but I I never saw the man himself. He's, um, but people uh, write about him. You can find out about him if you Google. <laughs> That's cool, Uncle Buddy. All right, <laughs> yeah. That's right. And I, I remember I, one day I saw this guy uh, drives up in this. 1970 Buick Electra is dark brown with a tan top, and it had spoke wheels and these these uh, uh, Vogue tires, the so white mm -hmm. walls with the orange stripe. Mm -hmm. I'm listening to this car. It doesn't make a sound. You can't hear it as it drives by. My buddy from my neighborhood had a 440 uh, Chrysler, Vitar transmission, 410 Dana, uh, a virtually unbeatable car called the Rat Trap. <laughs> and he raced this guy with the Electra. I mean, to quote one of the crew, his crew, he said, that Electra took us apart. <laughs> wow. <laughs> These guys would, they, they specialized in that sort of thing. They would figure out who they were going to hit that night, and they'd set up the race. And then, of course, they would come back later and the Electra would have slicks or, you know, of course, the nitrous is there and they would take the guy out. They would know what his weaknesses were and they would, they would uh, race him for the big money and then take him out. Uh, it was interesting, interesting to watch. I bet. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, here I'm seeing it. So now... You're basically uh, uh, driving uh, a combat mission with this car, <laughs> you know, much, much like the airman did, and, uh, and and you know looking to take out some prey, but with this uh, this killer sleeper Buick that's got a rich history in that kind of underground street racing. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. Cars Illustrated featured that um, and an article on it going back to maybe 1987 and Scotty Gadagno's car is um, uh, the main uh, object in that article talking about it's one of the fastest street sleepers of that era. <laughs> Love it. Very cool. Yeah. Well, so let's uh, kind of circle the wagons and talk about the the legacy of the Tuskegee Airmen and, and kind of what you do with, with that group today and, and where can somebody learn more or, or, or get involved? The Tuskegee Airmen's Faithful Pursuit goes to Tuskegee Airmen events and national conventions. Uh, 
we look to, to wave the flag wherever we can. We, we let people know that the Tuskegee Airmen uh, are alive and well, and they are, um, you know, 98 <laughs> to 105. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. God bless them. Um, Heck yeah. We were fortunate to have um, the members of each of the four combat squadrons autograph the red tail of Faithful Pursuit. Man. Holy and cow. I think we've got um, 21 signatures in all. <laughs> and That's some amazing. Of the, yeah. Yeah, just over the years, just being at the different conventions, and I've had a pen handy, a silver paint pen, and asked them to, to sign. And we, our organization, you know, uh, as I mentioned, Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated, it's a national organization. Uh, however, I have a sub organization. It's what, called Return of the Red Tails. And so whenever we do an event and we participate in Tuskegee Airmen events, you know, we have to carry our own million or $2 million policy when we go to a venue uh, and the car is displayed inside of um, uh, a hotel or some other venue. And so uh, we have our own organization that supports the, the, um, the purchase of parts and, and all of the racing activity. I do most of the driving. <laughs> and we have a great team of people who have helped us to work on this car over the years. Now, if people want to learn more about the Tuskegee Airmen, uh, you can find out if there's a chapter uh, in your area by just simply Googling Tuskegee Airmen Incorporated. And you can mm -hmm. put your city or state and you can find out where that organization is. Now, the Airmen themselves, the World War II veterans, they're the people that started the organization. But today, um, you know, a good 85% of uh, people who participate in Tuskegee Airmen Inc. nationwide are sons, daughters, interested parties. It's a non-military, non-political organization that anyone can join. All oh, cool. we ask is that you have a sincere interest in uh, you know, supporting the the um, the goals of the airmen, which is pass on the history and help support our youth in, who are interested in careers in aerospace and technology, you know, our future. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's a it's a great mission. Um. Yeah, that, there's a lot to check out there. So uh, I appreciate you sharing sharing that. And you mentioned the the engines out. You're hoping to get this thing back together this spring to get back out uh, on on the strip somewhere. Uh, we're going to shoot for Bowling Green. The, the uh, Grand Sport Club of America has their annual convention uh, in the fall, mm -hmm. and that's what we want to. Be ready for them. You know, they they do some uh, drag racing out there and showing of vehicles, and so we want to be out there and uh, and set a new record for quarter mile. <laughs> what number are you looking to put down? Uh, low elevens. The current leader is out in Alaska. It's a, a gentleman that has a a vehicle he calls the mothership. <laughs> and this this car has come out of nowhere. He's beating up on uh, SRT Chryslers <laughs> at the moment with this gorgeous 1970 Electra Limited. It's cream with a white top. Oh, and, wow. Um, he's got white wall tires on the thing. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's launching an out. Uh, uh, running these guys, he, they're doing uh, like he's he's at eleven four right now hmm. in the quarter. Well, it looks like it's going to take an Electra to beat an Electra. Oh my goodness, he's uh, he's got quite a machine there. Yeah, <laughs> and, he, and he told me what 
I was just going to say what an amazing show that is to see, you know, this creamy Electra with white walls <laughs> <Just> <laughs> surprising the hell out of everybody. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's something to see. I had to watch it a few times because uh, I, I'm an Electra guy. I've seen them race and I couldn't believe what I was looking at. <laughs> because I the bet. visual the visuals are so freaky it's too freaky because the car is so huge he's <laughs> yeah. got white walls and he's blowing these 11 second cars away and sometimes he loses traction and he has to back pedal and then he hooks up and he still runs them down <laughs> jeez <laughs> that's cool and uh, yeah the mothership <laughs> so Can't he's the guy to beat all right. There goes uh, another uh, uh, internet rabbit hole I'm going to go down now. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> Checking that one out. Uh, so, Michael Joseph, you've got a huge um, forum thread over at the uh, AACA website. That's the Antique Auto Club of America. And if, you, yes. you know, if you're listening and you want to see – all the tricks that were done to this car is really unbelievable. Um, again, because, you know, most people don't think anybody would do this to an Electra. And you've got like, you know, you've got NASCAR strategy in there. You've got drag race stuff in there. Uh, er everything you can imagine. Just look up uh, the thread title is Electra GSX Road Racer and prepare to set some time aside. I I've been looking through that a little bit today and it's, it's a big thread. There's a lot going on. Great picks. Uh, really worth your time to check out. Yeah. Yeah. Too cool. Well, Mr. Joseph, uh, uh, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, we, we've made it to the part of the show where we're going to, uh, Mike and I, in a way, are going to reveal the answers to our trivia questions. And uh, because, you know, everybody, of course, is waiting with bated breath. So what was yours, Mike? <laughs> okay, I asked you guys, uh, what did Felix Wenkel of Germany develop in 1954? And Michael, of course, you uh, you bit right on that and said uh, the, rotor, the rotary engine, the Wenkel rotary engine. And, of course, Kevin, you uh, said in kind uh, the rotary engine as well. And congratulations, fellas. That is correct. It is hey. the rotary engine. Hey, right. Hip, hip, hooray. Thanks for the softball on that one. And Man. thanks for answering it correctly first. So I, uh, I, you know, I could. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Michael's a smart no guy. <laughs> there's no way Kevin was going to get that on his own. <laughs> Michael's a smart guy. I'm going to just do whatever he does. <laughs> All right. So my question to you guys was, what was the first flying car? And the bonus is what year? And uh, Michael Joseph, you said the 1960s or early 70s without really uh, a name. Uh, Mr. Cuball Clark, you said the Chanute flying car yeah, of man. 1959. I mean, if that's not correct, it should have been correct. It sounds historically accurate. I'll You're tell you right. that much. Sounds cool. Thanks. Thank you. I'm glad somebody gets me. Yeah. Well, the correct answer... <laughs> <laughs> is the Curtis Autoplane. Curtis Autoplane. In 1917. Really? Oh, so in 1917, goodness. Glenn Curtis, uh, who could be called the father of the flying car, unveiled the first attempt at mm. such a vehicle. His aluminum autoplane sported three wings that spanned 40 feet and the car's engine drove a four-bladed propeller at the rear of the car with some kind of PTO. And and there you go. Wow. It should have been a Chanute Aero car. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to let you have this. I'm going to do some digging on that one. I should have known that. Curtis is here uh, locally, the Curtis Museum. Mm -hmm. He's probably about uh, 45 minutes from where I live. Well, don't don't get any ideas to strap wings on that Electra because uh, <laughs> it sounds like it's got the power. <laughs> All right, guys. Well, listen, this was uh, this was a great uh, educational experience. Very cool story, um, Mister Joseph. We appreciate you joining us, and best of luck with uh, uh, gunning down the mothership this spring. We'll be looking for that on on YouTube. I have not made it out to the Buick GS Club of America event because usually I'm tied up with some other event, but I need to get down to Bowling Green and check this out um, because there's a lot of really cool stuff for, for Buick fans for sure. 
And uh, oh, yeah. also, th thank you uh, uh, for sharing a little bit of the story of the Tuskegee Airmen. Um, you know, real quickly, you being uh, very knowledgeable about the subject, any movies you recommend that uh, are good ones about those guys? Uh, there was an HBO special called The Tuskegee Airmen. It goes back to 1995. And then there is the movie Red Tails that um, uh, was made by George Lucas, I believe. And that is um, probably 20, 2012 or so. Okay. Portrayed them well in those uh, films? Yeah, yeah, they did. They did a, a fairly good job. So those those movies, Red Tails. That's a yeah typical Hollywood movie. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. good, good entertainment. Right on. All right. Well, if you want to learn more about all that stuff, um, just like you said, Google the Tuskegee Airmen uh, Incorporated. Right. That's the name of the. Yeah. Yeah, Google Tuskegee Airmen Inc. And um, yeah, bear in mind that uh, a lot of the people who helped the Tuskegee Airmen get their start were people from, you know, uh, they were white and black on both sides. You had people who believed in, uh, you know, uh, the abilities of black people to contribute to fight and fly, and, um, and it, it took all people working together to make it happen. Right on. Very, yeah, very cool. All right, gentlemen. Well, this has been uh, – it's been an excellent opportunity. Thanks again. It's uh, a lot of You're very welcome. interesting things to, uh, to continue to check out. Right uh, For sure. Yes. Kevin and Mike, thank you so much. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share and – God bless you both. Oh, you too, sir. You. And uh, uh, it's our again, pleasure. Happy to have you on. And uh, that'll about do it for us. If you if you like this kind of stuff, uh, click that subscribe button, and then um, whether you like it or not, you'll get an email with our next show. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> uh, don't forget the Facebook page. If you got comments. Uh, you can share them there or on our website at varadio.com. If you got a question for Mr. Joseph, um, we'll be happy to funnel those to him if you uh, uh, leave a comment on the website. Uh, I'm not going to give his email address out. I'll, I'll take the, I'll do the filtering and send those across. Yeah. That's right. And um, we'll see what happens next. So for Mr. Michael Joseph, Mr. Michael Cuball Clark. I'm Kevin Oste reminding you to aim high and don't stop believing.